Welcome and thank you for joining today's presentation, The Ethics of Race in Courts, moderated by Dorsey partner, Forrest Tadanipa. Take it away, Forrest. Hi, thanks, Sean. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, I'm Forrest Tadanipa. I'm a partner in the IP litigation group here of the Minneapolis office of Dorsey and Whitney. I'm joined here by two esteemed panelists. Uh, the first is Abigail Serra. Abby is a is senior counsel at Wells Fargo. She's a former public defender and was one of my classmates at the University of Minnesota Law School. Our other panelist is Roxy Gonzalez. Roxy is an associate at the with Dorsey in our Minneapolis office in the commercial litigation group. She has been practicing law for five years and she joined us uh, at Dorsey last May in the midst of uh, the pandemic quarantine. Um, so <laughs> welcome both of our panelists. Uh, we are here today, uh, we're gonna talk about obviously ethics of race in the courts. And just to give you a quick overview, you know, true to IRAC form, we'll start out with the rules that just come from a variety of sources. Um, the law of lawyering, of course, the professional rules of conduct, but also court rules and state statutes. We'll talk a little bit about the consequences consequences for violating those rules. Uh, and then we'll have some analysis. We'll have some a discussion about uh, identifying racism. You know, it's not always the, you know, I think a lot of people would tend to think, you know, it's not our problem or it's not a problem we encounter every day. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about obviously both overt and covert racism. And then we'll dive into a few different hypotheticals um, the hypotheticals are going to have an interactive component. We have disabled, unfortunately, the question and answer function and the chat function here. So you can't send us questions directly. And the reason we did that was just uh, in the interest of time and also with the number of attendees we have, it would get a little unwieldy. So if you do have questions, uh, just hang tight. And if they're not addressed, you can uh, contact any one of us offline contact me if you don't have anyone else's contact information, forest at dorsey.com. And uh, I will answer your question if it's for me and get you in touch with Roxy or Abby if it's for them. Um, so, and then we'll have a little bit, conclude with a little bit of a discussion on improving your practice. So to talk about the rules, um, we have Abigail, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Forrest. Uh, just a quick note before I dive in. Uh, we did create a sort of cheat sheet, if you will, with a list of all the rules that are going to be referenced in this presentation. So you don't have to worry about memorizing the citations or anything like that. Um, you will have a sheet available if you want it uh, to look back over the rules later. So let's go ahead and look at the rules of ethics, rules of professional conduct. First, uh, the primary rule on this point is ABA model rule 8.4. It is misconduct for a lawyer to engage in harassment or discrimination on the basis of race uh, in a group of other protected classes. And this is prohibited in conduct related to the practice of law. So the rules of professional conduct don't talk about what a lawyer does on his or her personal time, but this is in relation to their practice of law. Minnesota has a few distinctions from this rule and that's in uh, Minnesota's model, excuse me, Minnesota's rule of professional conduct 8.4. Um, in Minnesota, it is misconduct for a lawyer to harass a person on the basis of race or another protected class in connection with a lawyer's professional activities. So it does seem to set a bit of a higher bar than the ABA rule in that it's not, it's not discrimination, but rather harassment, sort of a higher level of mens rea, if you will. Um, but it is in connection with a lawyer's professional activities. So not simply courtroom litigation, but rather um, presenting CLEs or attending happy hours or anything like that that is um, part of your professional activity. And furthermore, in Minnesota, uh, it's misconduct to commit a discriminatory act that's prohibited, prohibited by law. So when you take that, uh, when you pair that with Minnesota case law and statutory law, such as the Minnesota Human Rights Act, you do get a very strong prohibition, an ethical prohibition against uh, discrimination on the basis of race. And then there's a few other states uh, that are getting ethics credit for this. 
Colorado, Iowa, North Dakota, Oregon, Texas, Utah, and Wisconsin all have rules that are almost verbatim, uh, AB, uh, almost verbatim to ABA model rule 8.4. Okay, in Minnesota, there's a few comments that are on point for this discussion and are on point for your um, practice. The first comment, comment four, says that um, basically it describes what is harassment and it kind of punts and it says harassment is defined by law and case law. The next comment that I wanna bring up here is comment six. And they, this was important to me because the, um, the writers called out in precisely that human equality lies at the very heart of our legal system. A lawyer whose behavior demonstrates hostility toward or indifference to the policy of legal justice under the law may thereby manifest a lack of character or uh, violate the rules of ethics. And the word indifference is very important here. You could violate the rules of professional conduct, not just by an affirmative act of harassment, but by expressing indifference or taking no action when you did witness some discriminatory behavior and you didn't intervene as perhaps you should have or could have. So those are two call outs. And next slide, please. Okay, there are some related rules. There is the duty to uh, communicate with your client, which we all know and love. Then there is the duty of candor. Um, lawyers shall not make a false statement of fact or law. And the next rule is that some lawyers can be responsible for the acts uh, or the violations of other lawyers. If you're a manager or you have supervisory authority over other lawyers, you can be on the hook for that subordinate attorney's uh, unethical behavior. So that gives you kind of a, an extra push to make sure that everybody's doing the right thing. Um, there are analogous judicial rules in the Code of Judicial Conduct. Um, a judge shall not manifest bias or prejudice or engage in harassment, which is not limited to bias, prejudice, or harassment based upon race. So this is actually stronger than the prohibitions for attorneys. You just can't even manifest that bias, let alone take that affirmative step of, um, of engaging in harassment. And this is also important, uh, judges shall not permit court staff, court officials, or others subject to the judge's direction um, and shall not allow them to engage in any kind of uh, bias or harassment. So really, judges have a very strong duty to control their courtroom, if you will, and make sure that proceedings um, go along without any kind of uh, bias or discrimination. Um, and just one call out, uh, a judge shall not hold membership in any organization that practices uh, invidious discrimination on the basis of race or other protected classes. So uh, I'm not gonna list what those might be, <laughs> but just, uh, just, just to be mindful of that prohibition. Next slide. Um, in the code of judicial conduct, a judge shall not, man oh, did I this one? shall not manifest bias or prejudice and not uh, allow others to do so. And um, the judges shall require, shall require lawyers to refrain from manifesting bias or prejudice or engaging in harassment. So kind of, a, uh, again, noting that judges are not allowed to let lawyers kind of fly off the handle and engage in discrimination in their courtrooms or in proceedings. There are some court rules on point here. General rules of practice for district courts in Minnesota. The first one, a judge shall at all times treat all lawyers, jury members and witnesses fairly and shall not discriminate on the basis of race. So not just the lawyers, but you have to treat the jury right too and the witnesses. And then of course, lawyers shall treat all parties, participants and other people fairly and shall not discriminate on the basis of race. So this doesn't just mean opposing counsel. It doesn't just mean your client. Uh, you can't um, you can't discriminate against the deputies or the law clerks, especially not the law clerks, uh, or anyone in that courtroom. There are some uh, litigation procedure rules that are on point here. The Minnesota rule of CRIMPRO is very strong. Rule 1.02 uh, 
uh, requires a just determination of criminal proceedings, as do all rules. Um, but it notes specifically that the rules of CRIMPRO must be applied without discrimination based upon race. So when you're speaking of issues of re um, relevance and bail and anything related to a criminal procedure, that must be done without discrimination based on race. And uh, the Civ Pro rule is a little milder, I will say, and it doesn't specifically call out discrimination, but it does require just determinations of civil proceedings. And all of these rules of professional conduct, conduct tell us what just means. Um, and so, so there is uh, a, a more subtle prohibition against racial discrimination. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned earlier, Minnesota does have a very strong law called the Minnesota Human Rights Act. This is statutory and it, it specifically lays out the policy of the state of Minnesota. And uh, Minnesota protects all people in, uh, protects all people from the discrimination in public services because of race, color, creed, religion, and other protected classes. And public services does include courts, uh, and litigation in courts. And the next section that I wanna call out is, is very on point and I think it should guide all of our discussions today. Such discrimination based on race threatens the rights and privileges of the inhabitants of this state and it menaces the institutions and foundations of our democracy. I couldn't put it any better. That's a summary of the rules and laws regarding discrimination. Thanks, Abby. Uh, Roxy, can you tell us a little bit about what the consequences may be for violating one of the rules that Abby just discussed? Sure. Some of the consequences include having ethics complaints um, lodged against you, being having a reprimand or even disbarment. The Office of Lawyers Professional Re Responsibility um, would investigate any allegations of ethical violations and they would make rep recommendations to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Beyond those types of serious ethic violation consequences, um, we also have the loss of business that, that could be affected by being a repeated ethical violator as well as your reputational damage. Um, the legal market, no matter where you are, is pretty small and as soon as word gets out that um, an attorney is engaging in behavior that's unethical or really on the line. I think it's maybe surprising how many attorneys, not even within that area of law, quickly learn about that attorney's recommend, uh, reputation. In addition, there are recruitment and retention problems. Um, attorneys most likely would not like to work in an environment where they feel like they are required to continue or to perform ethical violations at all. That would create issues in being able to um, retain any attorneys that, that firms or other practices may have. Um, there are also issues of interpersonal conflicts. Um, it's uncomfortable to have some of these discussions, but it's much more difficult to have an attorney leave a firm or a business because they feel like that is not an area where they are able to practice law according to the rules of professional um, responsibility. And finally, really we become very ineffective courtroom advocates if we are not able to follow um, the ethical rules and, and support our clients in the best way possible. So all of these are consequences for any ethical violations. Thanks. Roxy, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how race may come up in, in the context of the practice of law. First, you know, I think a lot of us think that um, it's uncommon for it to directly come up. And I think that's true. Uh, fortunately, you know, this is, the, this is a profession, obviously, and it's not, um, you know, it's one, I think, where people particularly pride themselves on being intellectual and having civil discourse. And as a result, I think that you it is going to be less often when there's some sort of direct or overt racism, like the use of a racial slur or some sort of, you know, overt discrimination in hiring, firing, et cetera. But obviously, you know, 
it's we're not immune just because we are um, go through you know whatever 25 years of school to become you know intellectually uh, robust they were not immune to racism uh, and so there are still obviously instances where that sort of thing happens um, and it's unfortunate but it's still there but obviously it's the one that's easiest to recognize when you know someone uses a slur or you know it ha you know has an, has an obvious biased um, you know an expressly an express bias that they that they have um, so the, what's more interesting and, and harder to spot or is when it's an indirect form of racism oh and what this is could be indirect or i guess i, I would call it direct but um i neglected to mention it but you know there's sometimes where it comes up even though we pride ourselves on being um you know civil in our discourse and intellectual etc you know there are still times when people use what i would call overt or direct racism without maybe re even realizing it and that's because you know there are terms in our society that exist that have a racial connotation um and the one that i called out here is one that i've heard you several times um and that's indian giver you know being someone that goes back on their promise um and obviously given the context of the word it's a highly offensive term but for some reason I think people just have tended to use it without, you know, maybe giving it a second thought about, you know, this is a racially charged word, or this is a word that would be considered highly offensive uh, by a Native American person. Uh, but they just, because it's just a word that they have grown up with or a word that they, they've used that has a specific meaning, they just tend to throw it out there. You know, I've seen it used um, in open court. I've seen it used, you know, in chambers and just kind of, uh, you know, it's something that comes out there. So I'm, there's other words like that, other phrases like that. Uh, and it's one that is, is I think, a direct form of racism, uh, but one that people may not necessarily always can, you know, they might say, I'm not a racist, or I don't have racist intentions, but then use for terms like that. So just a reminder um, to be aware of our vocabulary, what things mean, where they come from. Um, indirect racism has a lot of forms Maybe we can just throw out a few different bullet points um, while I discuss them. Thanks. Um, one is, of course, the other rate of people that can happen um, in, a, in a variety of different ways, which is making, you know, like those people, you people, those sorts of terms. One that I think it was a popular topic of uh, discussion I've had in a few different fora recently is the question, you know, oh, where are you from? And I think that's kind of controversial, or it's a topic of conversation often because it's not often intended to be um, to be discriminatory or to have any sort of meaning other than, you know, just curiosity of getting to know someone. So my general rule of thumb that I always uh, I told Roxy and Abigail was, you know, it's fine to ask the question as long as you are willing to accept the answer. And by that, I mean, don't say things like, where are you from? And the person says California and you say, no, where are you really from? Or, you know, something that happened to my brother one time was that he had a, someone ask him, well, where is your last name from? And he told him the United States, because that's where it is from. And then the person said, no, it can't be, that can't be from the United States. So, uh, you know, obviously just people not accepting the answer, um, making it, you're not being willing to list and challenge their own implicit biases that they may have that sort of thing that results in the othering of people uh another one that comes up a lot and it's probably not unfamiliar unfortunately to the female attorneys that are here but it's that i want to talk to the real attorney or who's your supervisor i want to talk to the one i want to talk to the real lawyer on the file or whatever you know those sorts of things um there's obviously there's other hot words or proxy words that are used. Sometimes people will say like dog whistles. Um, one that is near and dear to my heart is uh, thug. And I say that because uh, I always brag to my kids that I personally know Richard Sherman. Uh, he probably doesn't remember me, but we were on the track team together at Stanford. Um, he was on the football team and the track team. People don't know that, but uh, he was famously called a thug, um, you know, after, uh, a, game, a playoff game one time and it, it raised the, the profile of that word a lot and people were saying things like if you know getting a 1400 on the SAT and going to Stanford means you're a thug I want my kid to be a thug just like Richard Sherman or whatever but you know it has a connotation of you know specifically directed towards um, African-American men uh, but it is something that can come up a lot I think it comes up it, 
and words like that can come up in the, in the context of the practice of law. You know, that person, they're trying to be a thug in the courtroom or this other side, you know, they're a bunch of thugs or whatever. Um, geography oftentimes can be a proxy for race too. Instead of, you know, talking about African-Americans, people can make references to North Minneapolis. Um, other races, you know, too can have things that similar to that, you know, I mean, Roxy's from Texas, I believe, and then the Southwest people, again, has a connotation of how, how you talk about it. Um, so all different ways that it can come up. Um, and again, it's not, it's not to say that anything in particular, like asking where you're from is wrong or racist, but just to have everyone have your radars, your antennas up as to how it can come up, how it can be construed, how it can be taken. Um, because like everything else, I mean, the reason it's indirect or the reason that it's implicit is because people are trying purposefully or, you know, unconsciously to hide racism either from themselves or from other people. So they're not, they're trying to, to hide it. So it's not necessarily something that you're going to spot or they're going to admit to, but it at the same time has the same effect. Uh, it has the effect of hurting people, of preventing their access to justice, preventing their access, you know, in their career to advancement to clients to whatever it is. So it has the same effect, whether it's direct or indirect. Next slide, please. Okay, Roxy, can you talk about signs of bias? Sure. Some of the signs of bias, which Forrest already touched on a number of these, are direct statements or use of slurs, overt act of racism. I do agree with Forrest that in our practice amongst colleagues, we generally don't see these types of statements happening. Um, that's not to say that we don't see them in other avenues of our lives or with our clients or in more discreet ways, but direct statements are generally not terms that, um, or examples that I've experienced in my career up to this point. Um, dog whistles, Forrest talked a little bit about that, but to expand on that, those are generally terms that on their face have a plain meaning that doesn't arouse any immediate suspicion, but clearly there's a second, um, a second message that's trying to be communicated with some of those terms, terms um, such as inner city or a big one right now, suburban housewives. Um, those terms communicate much more than just the direct or or initial meaning of, of those terms. Um, in addition, sometimes a response from a party is disproportionate to the facts. Somebody getting really excitable about something that maybe doesn't warrant that type of response um, or just assuming that because someone is from the north side, something is going to go a specific way in a matter. Um, additionally, there are references to facts or circumstances not related to the matter. Um, we'll talk on some of these in the, the hypotheticals that we discuss a little later in the presentation. We um, also see sometimes attorneys be dismissed as a complaint that they are making, um, them taking the statement too, sen they're too sensitive or you're not understanding it the right way or you don't know that person the way I do. Um, but the reality is if somebody is making a point to say that they are uncomfortable or feel like they have uh, some, that terminology has been used that should not be, we should all take a step back and really consider how to be thoughtful about that and not automatically um, be dismissive or try to justify what was said. And in addition, right into the next bullet there is the refusal to use different words or change actions upon request. Um, if somebody has made a point to ask you or let you know that a specific term is not acceptable to use, um, period, or with them, uh, we should all really try our best to be thoughtful of that. And um, especially in planning this CLE, it's very clear that we all come from different backgrounds, that we have different understandings of what certain terms may mean. And there's no way for any one individual to fully appreciate the spectrum of, of terminology that can be harmful, but it is our responsibility first as just people, but also as attorneys to respect when someone has tried to educate us about terms that we should or should not be using. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about options um, and how to address racial bias or discrimination. 
Um, and I don't know how I got it, this slide because in my opinion, this is this is the hardest slide. And I think I got it because I specifically told Abby and Roxy that I was uh, doing a presentation one time and someone had a question, you know, is how do we address this? And I was stumped. Um, because it is hard. So, well, these are all, you know, so this is after some thought and deliberation of what to, what we, what are some options we can say, what can we do? But I think one of the reasons that it is hard to address, obviously, is because it is um, racism, you know, it's a power dynamic that's systemic in nature. And so it's self perpetuating in that way, you know, that the people that are affected don't necessarily have the power to affect any sort of change. And that's why, you know, 500 years after uh, Columbus set sail, you know, we're still here and still having, you know, discussions about race because it is entrenched um, because of that power dynamic. So that's why, you know, the risk, the number one thing you could do is you could just do nothing. Um, and this may be an option that is unfortunately compelled by, you know, the position of the person, you know, if you are a person of color, that's being subjected to some sort of host racial Louis based hostility um, as a lawyer, uh, you may not feel comfortable doing anything, you know, and that may be for the reason I think that Roxy was just discussing being labeled as, oh, you're just too sensitive or like being perceived as a person that is making complaints and even though you know they're gonna be dismissed, it seems futile and you don't wanna risk your own reputation by saying anything. Um, so that may, unfortunately, because of the power dynamic, be the, the strategy that is used. Um, but of course, that's not the strategy that we want to encourage, because although it has a zero risk of confrontation, you have zero risk of there being any sort of blowback onto yourself. There's also then a high risk that the behavior, um, that the hostility will continue. The second suggestion uh, or possibility we have is just to, again, to slow it down. You know. I think one of the time, one again, and I think a lot of female attorneys on the on the line here may have uh, some sympathy for this or have experienced this. But you know, like one of the times your first reaction if you're experiencing hostility is to just get into that fight or flight kind of mode where you you know don't even know what to say or what to do. You just know you know that you you're being affronted. So an easy way to stop that is just to take a break, take a deep breath, and then think about what to do let the other side obviously there are maybe in a similar position where their emotions are running high and they're allowing these things to slip out so that break may help benefit them where their other opposing counsel can reflect if he's the one you know reflect on himself okay what did i just say that was inappropriate i need to slow my role here or if it's the client talk to the client be like you know things are getting out of hand here let's slow it down so again just simple kind of just ask just take a break in what's going on and whether it's at a deposition you, you can just take a break or you, your trial you can need to talk to the judge whatever you got to do number three just to say again super simple but just calling it out you know and this is kind of it's taking a one small step up from the do nothing where this is this is confronting the issue but it's not confronting it in a heavy-handed way so the risk of confrontation is still somewhat low but you're, you're reducing the risk of reoccurrence by just saying something, please don't use the term Indian giver, please don't say thug, please don't you know, question where I went to law school, who the real attorney is or whatever. The fourth one is to ask for support. And this one can be a little bit difficult, I think, because sometimes you know, we don't want to encourage people, um, we wanna encourage people to be self-sufficient, self-reliant, you, know, you don't wanna always have to go to the ally, you know, it's not like every case and every matter needs to have, you know, senior attorney white male on it just to make sure that discrimination doesn't happen. But at the same time, when you are a junior attorney, you may not know what what's normal. You know, am I, if I'm in this deposition, I'm getting badgered by the client, I'm getting badgered by opposing counsel. And I don't know if this is just how it always is supposed to go or if this is something that they're doing to me because I'm a junior lawyer, or if this is something they're doing to me because I'm a lawyer of color, or something they're doing to me because I'm a woman and a lawyer of color, you just don't, I mean, you can't possibly know what the norms are uh, when you're a junior attorney. So you have to then reach out to an ally that's a more senior attorney to find out, you know, is it, is this tone normal or is it not? And can they do something? Obviously when they are a more senior attorney, they have the relationship 
with the client, they have a more likely to have a relationship with the judge, more likely to know the opposing counsel, and then just more likely to have kind of the ability to call it out and say, hey, that was an uncalled for, that was beyond bounds, uh, you know, of these kind of informal norms that exist. Um, similar to that, you know, if you don't have a senior attorney necessarily right there and you're curious, you know, you can show transcripts, videos, whatever, um, two colleagues get their opinion, ask them to come along the next time, uh, you know, for support. Kind of going again up the scale, the next thing we have is to have an informal discussion with the judge or the magistrate. You know, if it's get really getting out of hand, get the, you know, take a break from the depot, call the magistrate, see what they say, try to get, that's kind of like going above the senior attorney to like, you know, the real boss, which is obviously the judge. Again, going up kind of the ladder you could file a formal motion in limine to limit discussion of, you know, if there's certain terms that have come up or certain actions that the other side's taken, having a formal motion. Um, for the situation where the client can be the problem, this can be really difficult, obviously. Um, you know, if you have a client, you want their business and you don't want to accuse them of being a racist, but sometimes they are saying things that are, you know, raising alarm bells, raising red flags. So how do you, how, how do you handle that? Um, obviously you want the business, but you don't want an ethical violation and you don't want to violate any of your personal morals that will exist around race and racism. Um, so you may have to, you have to get ahead of it and address it with them. And one of the ways to do that is to uh, remind them what the purpose of your services is, that it can't be used for a discriminatory purpose, uh, and to call it out in your in your engagement letter or your agreement that you will, you know, the purpose of the services and that you may withdraw if you feel like they're being misused for some reason. Another kind of specific context that comes up a, a lot is work allocation, um, and that may come up you know, generally or specifically concerning requests for proposal or responses to requests for a proposal, I guess. Uh, and again, a way, the specific issue being, you know, how is work allocated between attorneys of color and those that are not? Uh, and one way to address that is obviously just having internal rules concerning who, how is work allocated, who will be on RFP responses, if there are on RFP responses, how will they be used? Um, internal discussions regarding diversity inclusions, obviously another way to address our implicit biases. I think at Dorsey, obviously we have done that uh, pretty well. I'm sure you've all gotten, if you're with Dorsey, gotten a lot of the emails. Um, and then finally, you know, there's always the nuclear option depending on the circumstances and how bad things are. You know, you, you may have to file an ethics complaint, you know, and start some sort of formal process against the offender. Next slide, please. All right, um, we're going we're now to the uh, interactive part here. Um, we're going to talk about some hypothetical scenarios and try to have a little bit of a discussion on them. We have a few, but we got some time. We still got 27 minutes here. Um, and the one thing about these hypotheticals that I want to call it is there's not necessarily like a right or a wrong answer. And in fact, we've kind of tried to write the answers so that maybe what, you know, none is 100% right or 100% wrong. You know, like there's maybe one is 10% right, one is 20% right, one's, you know, 50% wrong, whatever it is. It's like not necessarily, or, or it's debatable. There's two ones that are equally valid and it's just a matter of how aggressive or you wanna be. Um, but in, in more or less, you know, the, the ethical concerns that arise just, you know, as they arise with any sort of, whether it's, about race of um, the ethics of race or the ethics of conflicts or the ethics of anything else. You know, I think one of the problems that always arises is when you have con conflicting duties. You know, like you obviously have a duty to your, you have multiple duties to your client. You have your duty to be a zealous advocate. You have a duty of loyalty, confidentiality, et cetera, to your client. And at the same time, you have these duties regarding race regarding race, um, and they can be in conflict. You know, if your client wants you to do something uh, that you're not comfortable with, or if your client is the one, you know, when do you blow the whistle on them and violate confidentiality, those kinds of things. There's always that tension, and that's the tension that comes up with all ethical um, concerns and issues, not just race, but just calling it out here, and that's why there's not always one 100% right answer in these hypos. 
Um, but Roxy, we'll go ahead and uh, discuss the first hypothetical. So our first hypothetical is you are a defense counsel in a premises liability case. The plaintiff is a person of color who does not speak English and requires a translator. Your client asks if you can call ICE to report the plaintiff and make the case and the plaintiff go away. Alienage is not in any way part of the litigation. What would you do in this situation? The next slide has the four answer options and you have a poll that pops up. So 65% of individuals who participated in the poll said that, no, we cannot. It's not permitted by law or professional standards. If you ask again, I will end this representation. Um, the, there were responses to the other options as well, including I'll look into it and never address it again. Um, this was a situation that I encountered early in, in my practice. Um, immigration is obviously a hot button topic and in the matter I was working on, we learned early in the litigation that the plaintiff was not in the country legally. We were asked by the client if we could report the plaintiff to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Um, I will admit as a Hispanic female, I have um, certain opinions about that that are not exactly related to this presentation. But I will also admit to that both the partner and I were equally taken aback at the request. Um, we did tell the client on that on that exact call that it was unadvisable to do so as the plaintiff could still bring the claim even if he was deported in the middle of the proceedings. The claim doesn't just go away as an initial like, let, why are we having this conversation? It won't really fix what you're trying to fix. Um, but also we discussed that it was a violation or could be a violation of the rules of professional conduct. Um, Abby pulled up and discussed uh, ABA and Minnesota Rule 8.4. So it's, um, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that he or she knows should or reasonably should know is harassment on the basis of race or national origin. Obviously the Minnesota Rule is more expansive than just the practice of law, um, which makes it even more pressing for the attorneys in Minnesota. In addition to that, section five of the preamble to the Minnesota Rules of Professional Conduct reads that a lawyer should not use the law's procedure, procedures only, um, I'm sorry, should use the law's procedures only for legitimate purposes and not to harass or intimidate others. And a third area in the Minnesota Rules is comment 12 to rule 3.3, which reads that lawyers have a special obligation to protect the tribunal against criminal or fraudulent conduct that undermines the integrity of the adjudicative process, such as intimidating a witness. Um, in the Ninth Circuit, the Court of Appeals in, I think it was 2016, held in Arias versus Raimondo, that an employer's attorney could be liable for FLSA retaliation claims. In that case, the attorney repeatedly contacted ICE to provide information about the plaintiff and suggested a meet and greet in an attempt to derail the plaintiff's lawsuit. Um, the, the plaintiff in that case did actually settle the in initial lawsuit and then turned around and sued the attorney for retaliation of um, under FSLA laws and the Supreme and the Ninth Circuit held that he could be found liable for the for that behavior of contacting ICE and trying to get the, the plaintiff deported. Um, in 2018, the Supreme Court denied the appeal to hear the matter again. So that law stands in, in the Ninth Circuit. I will say as a more junior attorney, I appreciated the partner's response was almost immediate that we were not going to do that. He handled that immediately with the client with me on the line. Um, 
which I appreciate because to Forrest's point earlier, I was so caught off guard. I had no idea how to professionally say no um, because I was very concerned about the ethical violations that would occur in the event that we chose to move forward. Um, and I also appreciated being part of the conversation as a more junior attorney so that I could learn how to have those conversations by myself later in my career um, as inevitably questions similar to this, maybe not the same, will potentially come up again. Um, and although this hypothetical is geared towards civil litigation, the ethic rules, ethics rules are also important in criminal litigation. Abby, would you mind touching on that? Sure. It would be misconduct for a prosecutor in a case to threaten a defendant to say, you know, either take this deal or I'll call ICE. That would be just a pollucid violation of the rules and very clear misconduct. And it's worth noting it would be misconduct, a different kind of misconduct for a defendant to threaten a witness or a party to say, hey, if you testify, I'm going to call ICE so you can't testify. That would be witness tampering, which is also a crime. Don't do it. End of sermon. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the next typo. Okay, I think I'm going to read this one. You represent client leading up to the deposition. You've been in regular communication with opposing counsel. These have been vigorous negotiations, but professional in tone. At the depo, the client meets opposing counsel for the first time. Client bristles under questioning and becomes defensive. His comments start to cross the line from being just um, rude to being pejorative ad hominem remarks to opposing counsel. At one point, client actually says, do they even have law schools where you come from? Opposing counsel is a person of color. What do you do? Okay, we have a poll. Um, do you do nothing? You personally didn't cross any lines, so there's no problem. Do you request a brief recess? Advise your client of ethical issues? Do you just stop the depot entirely? Um, or do you immediately withdraw from presentation? Representation, excuse me. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people um, said, slow it down, uh, request a brief recess, advise your client of the ethics issues, consequences in litigation, return to the depot. I think that's a very good way to handle it. Um, you could take a stronger position, sort of depending on what the tone of your, your client's voice, what was said, if they continue to say things like that, you know, maybe one statement, you just request a pause, if they just keep coming at it, you might have to just stop it all, just pull the plug before it gets any worse. You know, it's all, it, it kind of depends on the individual situation. I would say that doing nothing really opens you up for an ethics, um, either a formal ethics complaint or, you know, an uh, unpleasant phone call from the judge or magistrate or an in-chambers discussion that you don't want to have. So probably you need to do something to advise your client. And that's because as you pointed out before, there are other rules that prevent you from just merely being indifferent. So even though it is true that your client is probably, is, is, as this hypo was written, not a lawyer, uh, you as the lawyer representing him or her, you can't be indifferent. And also, you know, you may need to use this deposition testimony somewhere down the line. And obviously you can't be um, the proponent of some sort of you know, you can't be in, in connection with your professional activities, the proponent of some sort of testimony that is constitutes racial harassment. And again, I mean, I think most people, it seems like picked up on this. Um, but yeah, obviously, saying where do you have, do they even have law schools where you come from is kind of the, as we said, the proxy words, geography, you know, even though, you know, on its face, someone could say, well, I thought they were from a different country. Well, why did you think that? Uh, presumably because of the color of their skin as presented in the hypo. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about the next hypothetical. All right, this is kind of the flip side of what we just talked about, where before you were the um, lawyer representing the bad actor, now you're on the other side and you are the lawyer that is receiving the hostility from the bad actor. So you are an attorney, a person of color taking a deposition. The deponent becomes increasingly hostile and uses microaggressions such as mispronouncing your name, 
repeatedly and smirking, the hostility escalates and the opponent says, do they even have law schools where you come from? The opposing counsel is sweating profusely, but says nothing. What do you do? Option A, nothing. It's not your client. He's making his own case worse, kind of digging his own grave, so to speak. B, request a recess, speak to opposing counsel about potential ethical issues and request that either rein in their client or you will call the judge. C, stop the deposition, re-notice it for a later date and ask a white male to take it. Or D, file an ethics complaint against opposing counsel. All right, it looks like the results are in and I think you all can see it, but if you can't, uh, the overwhelming majority was that to request a recess, speak to opposing counsel about the potential ethical issues and request they rein in the client or that you will call the judge. Um, I think this was obviously uh, kind of the most tempered response, um, which is why I think it was doing something, but not you know going nuclear, although two people would have done that. Um, so which is why I think it was the most uh, most popular. I certainly think it is um, would be my preferred answer. I mean, I think there is something to you know say that there are in a lot of these cases, the interests are aligned. Um, so if you, the person is making themselves to look bad, they are making their own case worse. So I think there's certainly a kernel of truth to that. Um, I think there's also a kernel of truth to that you could read at stop to stop it and ask it to be re-noticed um, and ask someone else to take it. But again, you know, we don't always necessarily, in my opinion, want to have white males taking every single deposition, right? And so certain sometimes that may be necessary, but it, I'd also want to let the attorneys of color be the ones to have the experiences. And then of course, um, I think hosts aren't supposed to be able to vote, but I think one of those two people that wanted to file an ethics complaint was probably Abby. Um, she likes to go nuclear. Um, but obviously, you know, there could be, could be a problem there. So next typo. Okay. You are a judge and a civil suit is set for trial. You have concerns about the lawyers and or the parties using inappropriate language in front of the jury. The pleadings contained a few phrases that could be perceived as racist. Also, one of the attorneys regularly mis mixes up your two law clerks and calls them nicknames rather than their actual names. The witness list includes people of color and it is reasonable to assume that the jury pool will be diverse. What do you do? So here's the poll. You could do nothing. Parties can make an objection or an argument if they want. You could schedule a chambers meeting with attorneys and talk about expectations for a clean trial. Um, and note that that includes appropriate conduct for court staff, not just uh, attorneys. Um, at trial, you can make some sort of statement on the record. You could file an ethics complaint against the rude or offending attorney, or you could do uh, B and C and possibly D if the attorney refuses to correct uh, their behavior in chambers. Ooh la la, okay. So people people wanna just do it. They just wanna <laughs> take care of it. Um, I wrote this hypo, this is actually based on an experience, an experience I had when I was a law clerk in US District of New Mexico. We had a case, uh, my judge had a case rather, uh, and the attorney just happened to be, uh, I, I don't know how, to, just had multiple, multiple, multiple ethics violations and was actually disbarred about six months after I left Chambers. So just to kind of set the tone of this attorney. Um, and the pleadings were, you know, towing the line of appropriate. And there was a lot of blue language in Chambers and just a lot of problems like that. So the judge saw anticipated problems a mile away and the judge gave me a writing assignment to write down a list of inappropriate words uh, in English, Spanish, and New Mexican slang. So there would not be any doubt as to what could not be said. And then he read the list in court and said to all the attorneys, this is a federal court of law. We're gonna have a clean trial. We're gonna talk about difficult issues, but we're gonna use appropriate language. You shall not say, and he proceeded to read the whole list. I think that's pretty extreme. I think it rarely requires that, but it does show that um, calling attention to the judge, perhaps an in-chambers conversation or a motion in limine saying, uh, 
we can talk about drugs, but we can't talk about cartels or that use the word thug. That can be an effective courtroom advocacy to prevent discrimination. Oh, okay. This is where I have to announce the CLE code, which means I have to actually I have to find it too. Forgot that this was coming up. I can announce it for us. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> it's R Z X one two seven. R Z X one two seven. Thank you, Roxy. And then let's do hypo five. So hypothetical five is your client is a commercial property owner. She has a tenant who is not paid rent for five months. It is not a pandemic. She wants to start eviction proceedings and provides you with plenty of documentation to support the non-payment claim. While you are talking, she starts rifing on how bad it has gotten on the north side. She talks about dangerous tenants um, about how dangerous tenants are, quote, over there, and she thinks the tenant could catch up on rent but wants them out as soon as possible for safety. You ask if there have been any incidents or any problems besides the non-payment. She says no. She spontaneously volunteers that she just wants to evict this tenant before things get violent. What do you advise, how do you advise your client? Option one, do you do the eviction without hesitation. Missed rent is missed rent. Option two, charge more because she's going to be a handful. Option three, take the case, explain limitations of your representation, add a paragraph to the contract to address your specific concerns with this client, or option four, decline to take this case and advise of ethical concerns. So as you can see, most chose between option three and four um, to take the case with the certain limitations that are written into the contract or to decline to take the case at all and advise of ethical um, concerns. So again, pointing, reminding people back to Abby's presentation at the onset, um, rules 4.4 and rule 1.4a. Um, in particular, I wanna point out rule 1.4a because it is important for attorneys to consult with the client about any relevant limitation on an attorney's um, conduct or ability to um, provide counsel when the lawyer knows that the client's client expected assistance is not permitted by the rules of professional conduct. Um, I think this example also falls under some of the conversation Forrest had earlier where it's not in your face and the client would most likely say that they're not being racist, they're just being concerned about their property um, or they're just, you know, those people or that area, these kind of hot, hot, um, hot words. Um, the reality is that, that the tenant has failed to pay rent and the eviction law is, um, allows an, a tenant to be evicted for failure to pay rent. So at least on the basic premise level, there is a claim here that is able to go forward. Um, the discussion really does need to be had about whether or not there are legitimate safety concerns. Um, and if so, really discussing those, laying them out and making sure that they're not just conversation pieces to hide what the, te what the landlord is attempting to do. Um, but if the tenant, if the client is unable to provide specific examples demonstrating genuine safety concerns, it's important to reiterate that the eviction is based solely on non-payment and that we will not be discussing any unfounded claims of safety concerns and that both the attorney and the client have a duty to be honest with the court and those claims cannot be and should not be discussed before the court without any ability to provide proof of those types of allegations. Um, unfortunately, it may become a situation where terminating the representation may be necessary. Um, and I appreciate that there are a lot of attorneys of various levels in various areas of law on this call, but 
there usually is an, an attorney who is responsible for the client relationship, regardless of where people are working or, or in what areas of law. And in these types of situations, it is really important that the client relationship partner be aware, be made aware of some of these concerns um, so that it is on their radar. And so that if this situation does ultimately become a situation where the representation needs to be ended, that that individual is part of those conversations. Um, as a more junior attorney, I have no idea how long some people have had these clients and what the dynamic of those relationships are. And I would hate to um, harm that more than it will already be harmed by having to terminate representation. So another thing to consider as well. Do we have time for one more, Forrest? Uh, let's look, what's the next one? Let me just look at it. Oh yeah, well, these are, these are um, I think some of my favorite ones coming up, but I don't think we do have time. Um, maybe we can, uh, if you guys can just look through this real quick, um, we can do one more real quick without discussion. This is about RFPs. You have to include a diverse attorney in RFP under this hypothetical law firm's uh, internal procedures. You So you do that. Uh, you haven't worked with that particular attorney before, but you've heard a lot of bad things, negative comments about that attorney. So you also include your friend uh, and you and your friend do all the work and there isn't really anything for that one person to do. So you just bring him or her along to the court hearings with you. Is there a problem, ethical concern? No, because you followed the rules and you are training that associate and it would be actually an ethical violation towards your client if you gave that new associate more work than they could handle. Maybe you're probably violating the spirit, but you're not violating the letter of the law and you can cure any violation by disclosing uh, to your client that you're not gonna be following the work allocation you said in the RFP. Or number three, yes, you are discriminating against the diverse attorney by not including them in the work and you were dishonest or less than candid in the RFP response. So hurry up and vote because we just got a couple minutes. Looks like um, three was the most popular, two, and then one. Um, I mean, I think again, that there is a kernel of truth in one that you do have an ethical duty, um, but if that's the case, you shouldn't include them in the RFP in the first place. And I think that's one of the things too about why it's important to work with new lawyers and, and get to know them because you know, you're know you going, you're not giving them work based off of essentially hearsay. Uh, so you should probably have a duty to yourself and to, to that person to work with them or at least get to know them a little bit to verify and then either include them or not include them based on your own opinion whether they're good or not, because you do have, it is true that you do have a, a duty to your client to make sure that uh, the work is done properly. Um, B and C again, both of them are, are, are decent answers, um, but you certainly need to disclose it to your client or else that would, you know, it would be a breach of some duty of candor. Um, but more than, you know, as everyone identified, you know, you should, you shouldn't discriminate against attorney by not including them in the work, especially if you said you would. Um, so let's move on to the to the last slide since we just got two minutes left. Even though I encourage everyone that has available, you know, the ability to look at these hypotheticals to look at them because I think there are interesting things that did happen or that they were based on real things that did happen uh, and kind of illustrate kind of, I think the subtle ways that race can come up in the practice of law. So Roxy, why don't you take us home? Sure, so just in summary, it's important to keep these conversations going. Continue to attend CLEs and other presentations. Have conversations with your colleagues about situations that arise. Um, they're not only beneficial to you as the person in them, but to the other people you speak with about how they would react and interact. Um, review the rules from time to time, especially before court hearings. I had a judge tell me one time that I should spend Christmas break going through the rules of professional development every year so that I could make sure that I was never in violation of them. Um, re recognize hot words and actions that could be perceived as discriminatory. Invite a junior attorney to coffee, learn more about them as an, an individual. Um, that helps to encourage you to work with them in your practice and, and to develop their skills. Proactively litigate, file motions and eliminate if they're needed. Um, 
the highest person in the room takes the highest road. If that's the judge, the supervisor, they may need to be the one to establish the boundaries. The reality is that sometimes junior attorneys do not have the authority to set the tone. Um, and finally, rise to the moral moment. Make a personal commitment to improve your practice and, and to continue to be allies to those attorneys that need your support. Thank you so much for attending our presentation. If you have any questions, like Forrest mentioned, you're welcome to reach out to any of us that you would like. Um, and there is a link in the chat feature to ensure that you get credit for attending the presentation. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Forrest or Abby, but thank you very much. That's all folks. Thanks so much for your time and your attention.